and welcome everyone. Um, so as Kate said, I am an attorney, but I promise I will not be talking about uh, legal or licensing stuff for the most of this talk. So what I'm uh, going to be talking about is talking about the software build materials features that we added to Zephyr last year um, and talking about next what they are, what they, uh, how they work, and uh, then opening it up for discussion for what's next. So. I'm going to do a very quick intro to SBOMs and to SPDX specifically. Uh, then we'll talk about Zephyr and SPDX getting into some of the weeds and then open it up for discussion and a few questions that I want to ask the group. So diving right in, um, you may or may not have heard the term SBOM. It's been getting a lot more attention in the last year or so, but it stands for Software Bill of Materials. Uh, it's essentially an ingredients list for software. So it's a, a detailed list of what is in the software that you use, what are the dependencies that it uses, something that documents what actually, what composes a piece of software. Um, and the NTIA, a uh, federal government agency, um, over the last couple years, thanks to Kate and several others who have been involved in efforts that NTIA was, was facilitating, um, has worked on putting together a formal definition of what is an SBOM and what are the minimum elements that should be in an SBOM. Um, and so there are a few there are a few different standards for SBOM metadata that have been recognized as including sufficient uh, the minimum viable elements that NTIA has defined. And so one of those is SPDX. So SPDX is the Software Package Data Exchange. This is another uh, open source project that is supported by the Linux Foundation. Um, it's been around for what twelve years now, Kate. Um, and it it's a, it's a, defines a specification for communicating software bill of materials information. So it's the specific data fields and the formatting of a, of a document to store metadata about exactly this, about what is, so, what is a piece of software composed of. And SPDX is essentially a language. It, it essentially gives you nouns and certain properties on those nouns to be able to describe software, but it doesn't, SPDX itself does not impose a specific way that you have to describe the software. Instead, it's giving you the language to be able to describe it in a way that makes sense for your project or for your product in a uh, machine readable and interchangeable way. Um, and last year, it was, uh, it, it was recognized as an ISO standard. So, um, so kind of a parallel to that, in Zephyr last year, we uh, added functionality to enable someone when they're using West to build Zephyr, to build a Zephyr application, we added functionality to be able to, at the same time, with one command, create SPDX documents that are an SBOM for what you've just built. So the idea being trying to make it as low impact as possible for someone who is building a Zephyr application to, with one more command in West, get an SPDX document coming out the other side. Um, and the way that it does this is it leverages the file-based APIs that CMake provides. So this is functionality that's built into CMake, and I'll touch on this a bit later, but that lets you kind of easily be able to get at a lot of the internal guts of what CMake is doing when it's running a build. Um, and so just to, to describe it a bit more specifically, um, in a Zephyr build, and it's a very simplified view, obviously, but you've got the, let's see if I can use this, um, You've got the source files at the top, your he both the he sources and headers for Zephyr itself as well as for your application. And the build process is essentially compiling those, linking those compiled objects together, and then linking it down into the final binary at the, at the uh, end that you're going to be flashing onto the device. And so what, what the goal really is with an SBOM is to say, for that final linked binary, what's going on the device and going out the door, how do we document all the steps going back up so that you can trace that back to the original source files that were used and the different intermediate artifacts that were built along the way to be able to, um, to get to that final link binary? And then what, how do you document that in a way that you have that evidence as an artifact so later on if you need to go back and two or six years later understand what's in that binary that you originally built? Um, and so what the Zephyr SPDX fun functionality does is it gives you documents corresponding to each of those boxes. So it gives you an SPDX document at the top for the different sources, for the Zephyr project sources that you're using for your application, and then at the bottom, a document for the build outputs, for the final binaries that are being, that are being output. Um, and for each of the components of those different pieces, 
it's giving it gives you using the SPDX metadata. It includes data on the hashes of the different source files and the binaries, which is useful for file integrity and to to be able to match to particular versions of files that were used. It gives you um, relationships between that, so you can trace which files were which sources were compiled into which binaries or linked together. Um, and then from because of all the what I'm sure you've seen in the Zephyr sources, the SPDX license identifier tags. Because that standard has been implemented in Zephyr, we can take advantage of that and also grab that data and include, kind of as a side bonus, the licensing information about which licenses apply to which files and include that in the SBOMs that go out the door. Um, and the way that it works in, in SPDX, there's, a, it, there's functionality for uh, one SPDX document to link to another one and to reference another one. And I'm not going to get too deeply into the weeds on this here, but essentially what happens is the top, the top rows there, the top documents there, the Zephyr.spdx is defining the, describing the metadata for the Zephyr sources that you're using. The app.spdx is for your particular application that you're building. And then the build SPDX document um, refers back to those and makes reference to, and defines relationships between the built binaries described in that document and the, um, the original sources, which are defined in the Zephyr or the SDK or the app documents. Um, and here, so this is just kind of a visualization of the, a file, just a file in the built document. So this is, SPDX has a standard for how you, for uh, different ways you can define identifiers referring to certain packages or files. Um, there's a way to, there's also a set of relationships, one of which is generated from, um, that are defined by the SPDX specification that are ways that you can describe how one file refers to or relates to another one. Um, and so this is kind of, uh, this is one, I just lost the slides. Um, perfect. Um, so this is kind of one instance of one fact, which is, which is going to be documented in the SPDX document, which is that the libkernel library is built in part from the init.c file. And so within, and I realize this is going to be hard to read, um, but this is based, I, I won't dig into the details on this here, but if you look back at the slides later, this is explaining how the, within the SPDX SBOM, you can document that, that relationship that was shown on the prior slide, that this particular built binary file is generated from the source file that, for Zephyr that's defined in the other SBOM. So, um, so this is kind of a lot of metadata that comes out, a lot of uh, you know, data that comes out the other side. What are the benefits of actually doing this? So one of the major benefits is going to be that you have, um, it enables that sort of traceability back to the original sources. So that kind of what I was saying before, five years down the line, if you've got a binary that you built, that you shipped out the door, and now you're wondering, okay, which specific sources did we use to compile and build that binary? You know, hopefully, ideally, you still have an image of that particular set of sources lying around. But also, this is, this, uh, these SBOMs give you that metadata that were created at build time to be able to trace back so that you can understand if you used a, a particular version of a source file that had a vulnerability that was discovered later to be able to figure out which binaries you built based on that, uh, on that vulnerable file. Um, number two is similar. I was just mentioning the key point that it's evidence from build time. Um, a lot of use cases for, a lot of analysis and use cases for SBOMs tends to be retroactive looking. So taking a binary or taking a collection of software after the fact and trying to look at it and determine, looking backwards, determine what it's made from. And so the, by, by creating an SBOM at build time, you're flipping that around. You've got the, essentially the evidence at the best point in time when you've just built the software. And so you're able to document that and create that as an artifact that you've got later on for, uh, for review. The license information management, again, this is more on the legal side, but um, because of SPDX's original and continuing focus on licensing, um, being able to archive this information about which licenses applied to which source code files helps you understand what your obligations are when it comes to shipping that binary. Um, and then the, the fourth thing, the, the, an SBOM could take any sort of format. Um, one of the advantages of using a standard like SPDX is that it's a defined, it has, it's a defined standard, it has an, a specification, 
And so there's greater ability to interchange that and for recipients of that data to be able to plug it into their own tooling, their own processes, and consume it and make decisions based on it. So, um, so getting down a bit more into the weeds of how this works. Um, so I mentioned before CMake, uh, not specific to Zephyr, but just generally, CMake has a functionality called a fi the file-based API, where when a CMake build runs, it looks for any empty files, any files that are in this .cmake directory within this kind of well-defined location within the build directory. It look, if it finds this file kind of at this path that I've indicated here, the code model v2, if it sees that file present, even just as an empty file at the start of the build, then during the build, it outputs metadata at the reply directory that I've listed there. And that metadata is uh, just a series of JSON files that basically document what CMake is going to be doing. So it documents for each target stage in the build process, it includes JSON files describing what target file is it going to be building, so you, which library file or which, uh, what's, what's being compiled. Um, it identifies the target dependencies, so which build stages depend on prior ones or have to come after those prior ones. It lists out the different source files that it's going to use for that build stage. And then it also includes the specific compiler or command line options that, it's, that it is going to use. Um, and I realize this is going to be illegible, but um, yeah, it basically outputs that, outputs that data as a series of JSON files with different indices and references between them um, that w enable you to, uh, to understand what it is that CMake's going to be doing. Um, and this is just, I, as I was first experimenting with this and playing around some, I took um, that so there's series of JSON files and took the different build stage targets for Zephyr and ran it in ran it through uh, GraphVees just to see what the uh, the output of it would end up looking like. And it's a, you get kind of an interesting visualization of which different stages ultimately feed down into that uh, that bottom uh, Zephyr final target where the binary is built, the final binary is built that you're going to flash onto the drive onto the uh, the device. So just a second. Kate, hey, yes. There was a question coming in from the um, online, and the question is, uh, you know, can SPDX include Git hashes? So the question was, can SPDX include Git hashes? Um, and that, that's a good question. I would have to take a look back at the spec to say for sure. I believe a couple things in the one of the fields, I think, for packages, there's a package download location that describes different ways to refer to, to uh, files being downloaded from different locations. And there may be functionality. I know there's functionality in there to refer to different Git repos. I don't, I'd have to take a look back to see how that works. But for the, for the actual hash, sorry, go ahead, Kate. Got it. So the and Kate's comment there was um, for the S, the new uh, the next release of SPDX that's about to come out, version two three. Um, there's different external references being added, which are essentially ways to refer to document uh, to aspects of a package or a file that are documented elsewhere. And there's one being added is a Gitoid um, that is another way to refer to that. So I think that's being added for two three. So um, all right. So then. So what I was just describing was what CMake gives you in terms of the metadata about the build process that it's going to do. Um, so ZSPDX is then what we added to Zephyr. And this is basically another WEST command that we add. So it's WEST SPDX is the command. Um, and it's a set of scripts that concurrently with the build, you run WEST SPDX and it does a few things. It starts by going through and parsing that CMake JSON metadata to analyze the build. So it looks at it and says, okay, which targets are we building? Which source files are being used for those targets? Which ones are, uh, what's the relationship between those targets? Which ones depend on the others? Um, there's also functionality in there to do, um, to kind of do an another deeper look at the, at the build and to look at specifically which header files each source code uh, file is going to is going to include based on the particular command line arguments that are being passed. So kind of you can do it. The, the point of all of this is to get at of the kind of entirety of Zephyr, 
of, a, of the Zephyr uh, source code base. Which specific headers and source code files are we going to be using for this specific build, given the, uh, the, build, the arguments that we're passing to West and the, the way that we've configured it? Um, so the first stage is kind of doing that analysis. The second stage is then scanning, once we've determined which files are kind of within scope for that, um, scanning the files one by one and gathering that metadata that's going to go into the SBOM. So gathering what's the uh, SHA-1 and SHA-256 hashes for all the, for the source code files and the built artifacts, picking up those license IDs where we've got them and kind of gathering that data. And then the third stage is just outputting them as those SPDX documents. Um, so before I, before I go any further, let me just pause there. Um, any questions at, uh, at this point? I'm going to go into a little bit more detail and then open it up for some other, uh, some other discussion. But yes, Marty. So that, that is a great question. So one of the um, one of the challenges here, and this is part of what I'm going to get. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. So repeating it. Um, so I think the question was, uh, when I'm talking about the Zephyr code, what about the other modules that get pulled in? What about the other um, things beyond just the Zephyr, the Zephyr source code itself? Um, so one of the things about this is that what I've added here is it's more than a proof of concept, but it's still kind of an initial early stage at how to do SBOMs and how to do SPDX SBOMs for Zephyr. Um, so I'm personally, I'm still kind of very much a beginner at a lot of Zephyr development. And so one of the, I'm actually going to go ahead and bump up to the next, uh, the next slide because related to that. Um, right now it makes a, several assumptions about the user's build process and the way that you, um, where you're storing files, where different things are located. And a lot of that for when I was developing the first, the first uh, what we've merged for this, it was really based on um, some of the fairly basic samples for how to build Zephyr. And so one of the things that, I'm, that I want to do is to get more involvement from, the, from folks in the community to take, who are folks who are interested to help me take a closer look at this and figure out, are we picking up the right things? Like, am I pick, is it currently picking up everything it should be from modules or from things that are located outside of just the Zephyr sources itself? Because right now what it's doing is essentially if something is picked up as a CMake target, then it's going to go and include that in the SBOM. And so I think for, I'd, I'd have to look back, I think for some of the modules, I believe it does pick up quite a bit of, the, uh, quite a bit of that, but um, because I'm still fairly new to it myself, I don't know if it's picking up everything that it should. So, um, but essentially when it, it's really currently driven by what does CMake report out in that metadata coming out of the file-based APIs. And so there's a lot of things that it misses. So for instance, um, let me just switch over. For the app, for the app um, SBOM, so the one that's defining, that's describing the sources for your application. Here, I was. This is an example of one. This is actually the entirety of it. Um, for I think this might, this was probably the help, the Blinky uh, basic Blinky uh, example, and the I'll just quickly show the top part of it is essentially just metadata about the document itself. The middle part here is defining what SPDX calls a package, so the collection of files. Um, and then it includes one file entry per file that's being documented. And so the only file for this that's picking up is the source, the main.c file. So the other pieces of the app that are going to be relevant to the build, you know, things like the, I'm blanking at the moment, but the CMake definition file or the other, the other definition files that are sitting there in the, in the source directory, those aren't currently being picked up because we're doing a very narrow look just at what does CMake report out in the metadata. So one of the questions that I'm hoping to get more involved, more interested folks in the community are interested in looking at this is what are ways that we can make sure we're picking up the right scope of files to include in an SBOM so that it's going to be useful for the, for the downstream folks. So did that sort of answer your question? Um, it's a little bit, little bit roundabout, but... Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, so let me touch on a few of the other, um, what I would say are deficiencies for the way that it currently works. So I touched on the first two, kind of it makes a number of assumptions about what the build process looks like that might not be applicable for the ways that everyone's using Zephyr. Um, and it's really limited to what CMake is reporting out in that metadata. Um, there's also an aspect to it where it treats, I, I was describing, I just scroll back to the image, um, essentially each target stage that's def that CMake reports out is currently getting uh, copied over into the SPDX document as a package, even though a number of those stages aren't actually doing any compilation or any linking. They're not 
creating any new files. They're not creating any new package of, of files. The, some of the stages, hard to see there at the bottom, but are to flash the, the binary or to debug it or something like that. And so um, I think there are ways that this could be more narrowly targeted so that what's coming out is really more reflective of the actual software packages that are being created. Um, the fourth point here, uh, so what we're doing in Zephyr right now for SBOMS is very, I would say, very detailed at and source level, very focused on these specific files, these specific files that are source files that are compiled into these binaries. But not everybody's looking for that for SBOMS. There's also uh, definitely a use case for, and really what I think the NTIA was really more focused on was more of a package level SBOMS, something that is more, maybe not getting into the weeds on the sources, but just talking at a package level um, and providing that sort of SBOM metadata at a package level. And so I think it could benefit from adding functionality to be able to have the user when they're creating an SPDX document, if they want it at the very detailed kind of full build information, that's great. And if they just want something that's a very simple, kind of very small SBOM to describe the package, have that as, a, as an option also. Um, and then the last piece here is it doesn't, the, the NTIA defined I think seven or eight minimum fields that it expects to see in a kind of a minimum SBOM. And I don't think we're currently picking all of those up. So this, this I think is pretty straightforward to add, but it's a couple more things that, would, that should be added so that it's kind of meeting, meeting the minimum viable for NTIA. Um, so we've got about eight minutes left and I did, wanna, I did wanna open it up for discussion. So I've got a few questions I wanna ask the group and I'm gonna, Let's just do for the folks in here, let's just do a quick show of hands. Um, who has been, has anyone been currently using this? Uh, has anyone used the SPDX functionality? Great, so we got one, um, another one, awesome. And I know during the, uh, during the presentations earlier, um, Reno, for Renode, I believe Ant Micro was, was using, uh, using it for the dashboard. Um, are kind of for folks who didn't raise your hand, are, would any of you be interested in using this? If it, would it be relevant to your use cases? So seeing a number of hands getting raised, that's great. Um, so this, I, we can, if people have uh, comments on this off the cuff, that would be great, but it, this may be more, this might be more of an ongoing thing for us to, to address. But one of the big questions I've got that I mentioned earlier is just which assumptions are wrong? Like for the way that we've, I've currently designed this, it's making a lot of assumptions about how CMake is used, where how code trees are structured, what the different relationships between some of the files are. Um, and I think part of what we'll wanna do will be to validate which of those are gonna be generally applicable for users of Zephyr and which should be broadened or addressed in different ways. So, yeah, Marty. Yeah, I guess one question I would have is uh, thinking about the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if it's if you've got, you know, like just sort of data they obtain data that have been transformed from a file with potentially different types. Have you have you done any thought about any of the implications of that for your project? So that's a that's a great question. So the question was um we have device we have files like device tree files and kconfig files that are are essentially kind of the original source form that are then getting transformed into auto-generated header files or C, or C files that then are what gets used in the actual build. And so I think the question there was thinking about both, if I understood right, both how we document those in an SBOM, but also kind of to the side, how we think about those from a licensing perspective. Um, so yeah, you know, I think those are two slightly different topics, definitely related, but on the licensing side, probably more than I'll try to unpack right here, but something we should definitely talk about of how people think about licensing for this sort of model, for something that's the original file versus an auto-generated file that is derived from that but doesn't, wasn't actually created by a human. Um, for the, for the SBOM side of it, how we document that, I think what's probably being picked up right now would be those kind of downstream, the, the generated files because that's what CMake would be seeing. Not the, but we definitely we would wanna be picking up the actual original uh, device tree or, or kconfig files. Um, so that actually, so the, the graph there, uh, this was actually not using, uh, 
This was done taking the CMake metadata from, uh, from the file-based API and then running it through a separate, I think, Python script that I'd done um, as part of, as part of uh, running it through graph fees. So it's not using the Ninja graph. Another question that came in from the remarks mm -hmm. So the answer is yes. Yeah. It, so what it does currently? Is, yep. I'm sorry. So the question was um, do, that it's very difficult to, or I think you may have said impossible to find, um, w derive which header files are included in which order from uh, for C files, given whatever particular configuration it has. And so are we essentially asking the compiler which header files are included? And the, the answer is yes. So it's um, the, currently what it does is it uses. It calls out to GCC using the specific command line arguments that were included, that were retained by the CMake metadata, um, but but calls GCC with a couple of flags that cause it to report out which header files are uh, are being included, but without actually doing a recompile. So gives you essentially a dry run to say which header files are being included, and then we parse that to figure out which ones to include in the SBOM. So, um, yeah. So you asked a question about uh, assumptions on source code organization. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've done several times already is pull in another downstream open source repository, mm -hmm. extend it for interfacing with a separate build system, mm -hmm. and uh, using module.yaml in order to indicate uh, how we begin to get into that build system. But what it means is the organization of the code mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. So, so the the comment here was for um, for sounds like very common instances of taking a third party downstream open or a separate open source project and bringing it into Zephyr, um, the and including it in a module.yaml file that it's impossible to really make any assumptions about how it's organized or how it's going to build in connection with the Zephyr build. So I think for an, for something like an auto-generated SBOM, it's going to be really hard to make generally applicable assumptions about something that'll apply in all cases. Is that? That, that depends. Okay. I am actually adding Zephyr build CMake list mm. okay. in, in my extension to build that source code with all the right parameters mm -hmm. and uh, I, as opposed to triggering a sub-build of it. the open source code. Okay. Okay, so that so then so by not just using it and triggering a sub build, but by uh, actually adding CMake, adding to it to cause the separate project to build using the same Zephyr CMake setup, it may actually be possible in some cases to be able to hook in and get data about that the same way to in some ways the same way we do for Zephyr. So interesting. Yeah, question. Yeah. So, so let me let me just echo the qu the question. Um, so, the 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 comment was essentially asking about use cases for th what's coming out of this for the S bombs that come out, and noting that there are maybe the assumption that uh, there's kind of one common S bomb might not be applicable because people have different use cases. Some people are going to care about it from the security or traceability or technical perspective, 
while others might care about it more from the legal or licensing view. And Kate, do you do you want to? Yeah. And so, so to, to summarize Kate's comment quickly, so the, um, for, from the technical side, there's a security aspect to it of being able to trace down to the source level of knowing, is this particular uh, vulnerable file included in a, a built image? And being able to have that evidence to say definitively, like, yes, it was, or no, it was not after the fact. So, and the, that being useful. And you, you gave an example of a specific, a specific instance of that that I'm not going to remember. But um, so we are right at time. So I'm going to, uh, there, I do have questions here about what features would be useful. Like, where do we go next with this specifically? Um, but what I'm going to do is skip past that and uh, just ask our two, two questions. I think first, uh, are folks generally interested, not necessarily here, but interested in participating in kind of improving this, validating some of the assumptions, doing some of the work on um, improving what's there now. So just show of hands for anyone who's interested in this in the room, getting a bunch of hands. So that is awesome to see. Um, and then for those who are here also, um, interest in doing one of the unconference sessions and grabbing a conference room to probably later today and just chatting about this further. So seeing a, a few hands. Um, so cool. I will. Uh, right after this, go and grab a time on the signups. Are they back? They're back by the. Okay. Okay. Cool. And that will probably be for later today, because um, I will be heading out pretty early tomorrow. But I uh, just want to say thank you. Thanks for the uh, the comments and the questions. Good discussions. Yeah. Thank you. All.